welcoming you all uh, to this webinar. This is the sixth episode of the ALIA MSME Talks, and we are going to talk about skills. I'm Julia Imane Marsan, ALIA Director for Strategy and Partnership, and I want to thank you all for connecting with us for this discussion. And a special thanks goes also to our excellent speakers of today that I will introduce in a couple of minutes. We will discuss the importance of developing skills and also new skills for ASEAN MSMEs. It is a topic that is very high on the agenda of ASEAN as a region and individual ASEAN member states, and that for many reasons. The digital transformation is accelerating in ASEAN at a very fast pace, and that requires new skills for companies, but also because the pandemic will reshape dramatically ASEAN societies and economies. And this means that MSMEs need to be able to adapt to this transformation with the ability to learn new skills. It is also an area where MSMEs can work with other actors, for instance, governmental agencies, universities, tertiary education institutes, foundations, as we will hear today, and other business sector actors, and many more. Let me also highlight the importance to combine so-called digital skills, programming skills, being able to use IT solutions or data analytics with other types of skills. Research shows that by combining these different skill sets, workers can really thrive in labor markets. And I'm thinking about skills such as creativity, analytical thinking, but also emotional intelligence and empathy, the ability to work in a team or interpersonal communication skills, and also leadership skills, and very importantly, the ability to embrace change and cope with uncertainty. Being able to learn how to learn is of great importance in a world where uncertainty is high and change happens very fast. So we will talk about all these with our four speakers, but before introducing them, let me just remind you to please keep your microphone muted throughout the webinar, but please uh, uh, feel free to use the chat box to interact with us, to leave us ideas, comments, and also questions because we will get back to those uh, during the Q&A session towards the end of the webinar. Now, it's a great pleasure to have the chance to introduce to you uh, Yan Nang O, who is the CEO and co-founder of the Door Tech in Myanmar. It is a company which comprises three businesses, the Door Institute, providing uh, uh, consulting services from strategy level to functional level and executive learning programs, the Door Tech, that is a software and system development business, and the Door Communication, providing services of translation and interpretation. Young Nine has been working for SME development together with regional governments, universities, uh, and companies. In Myanmar, since uh, his company was established in 2017, the Door community includes uh, over 1,650 businesses including corporates, public companies, and small and medium-sized enterprises in Myanmar. He has been actively working to empower and strengthen skills of various professionals, including ministers, senior level civil servants, business owners, and also NGO professionals. Thank you very much for being with us. It's also a great pleasure to have with us Lydia Eng, founder of Think Technique in Singapore, she has 15 years of marketing experience in multinational corporations, SMEs, and startups. And uh, before becoming an entrepreneur, she was the head of marketing at Grab, where she led the team to their way to unicorn status. Congratulations, Lydia. She's usually at the forefront of doing something novel. And indeed, she has been a pioneer of the usage of different uh, uh, data analytics uh, in the marketing sector. And for that, she has received several awards, such as the Silver Award of the Digital Asia Festival in 2012. Uh, she was the winner of Best Use of Search of the Singapore Media Award, same year, 2012, and also Best SPOC Award winner from SyncTel. Thank you very much, Lydia. We're extremely happy to have with us uh, also Melanie Lindberg, who is the Asia Foundation Country Representative in Cambodia, she oversees a diverse portfolio of projects, including improving the capacity of knowledge sector institutions to 
to undertake quality research to inform public policy analysis and dialogue. And she's also involved in uh, uh, the women empowerment portfolio with projects to advance women economic opportunities through skill development programs. Melanie has also served as the foundation country representative in Mongolia and as the deputy country representative in Sri Lanka, the Philippines and Afghanistan. She has a bachelor's degree in international studies from Miami University and a master's degree in international and intercultural management from the School for International Training, World Learning in Battleboro, Vermont. Thank you, thank you uh, Melanie. And also, we are very happy to have with us uh, my colleague, uh, Rasha Shrestha, who has already participated uh, in another episode of this series. Welcome back, Rashesh. Rashesh earned his PhD from the Department of Agriculture and Applied Economics in the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research interests are labor market, economic development, and human capital investment. At AREA, he runs projects on these topics, but also global value chains, trade facilitation, regulatory management systems, and financial uh, please, all participants, keep your microphone mute, muted, please. Um, Prior joining area, he conducted research and gave courses <laughs> on applied <laughs> microeconomics and aid and development policy at the Australia National University, and he's originally from Nepal. We can immediately start the first round of questions, and let's start with our two entrepreneurs. I will ask them to give us a brief introduction of their businesses and also of the existing business climate in the respective countries, and then to share with us some perspective on the effect of the pandemic on their plans for upskilling. And let's start with uh, Young Nine. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much for taking the chance. So now, my name is Young I'm, I've been working for Footprints Company Limited. Uh, which actually a group of business, we provide uh, different services as she uh, already introduced. So basically like uh, we, we've been uh, working so hard uh, to pass through this pandemic basically. The second which is actually that has a significant impact um, rather than the first wave of the, this pandemic in Myanmar basically. In Myanmar, we all, we all suffer and uh, you may see the, the, uh, the number of the patient and the number of the death which already uh, increased dramatically within a few days. So therefore, the people, uh, basically the government trying to reinforce the rules, uh, uh, you know, the people have to obey. And also basically like every, every business had to stop based in the general term. However, what we're trying to do is like, we have to shift the strategy actually before the pandemic, even within uh, during the pandemic period. So what we're trying to do is like to shift the, um, the strategy that we have been operating and also they basically like um, to partner with the different organizations and institutions as well. So that, that will be a significant shift uh, for the business. So people now have been like, using the technology, uh, especially like digital transformation strategies uh, um, to pass through and whether they are seeking help and tools to, for their business. However, um, you may already see the, the report basically uh, in April and May, the already report the digital transformation strategy. 70% um, or 80% of the business are failing actually, like, um, you know, when they transform the business. That's why it is a very important that we need to understand the people processing technology. We cannot basically use the technology um, when we don't understand our process and people, our people's and process. That, that basically we've been seeing the things that, that the people are doing. Uh, a bit wrong, I can say. So the bit, therefore, like it's time is actually to save the money to use the our budget efficiently. How, however, we see the people having like uh, repeating the problem very often, especially they just trying to use the technology without understanding their people and process without uh, you know having the proper knowledge of how to transform their business and during this uh, COVID nineteen pandemic as well. So that this is something that I've been seeing. So for me. So uh, my business uh, for the dog talk, so we've been helping the people to like transform to you know, their process and we're trying to empower their business. That's why like, uh, we often work together with the Dog Institute and the Dog talk. The Dog Institute is a part of like uh, providing a strategy and, and, and also the training, the human development trainings as well. 
resources to development. And so we, the draw target, basically like you're trying to help them by using just utilizing their strategy uh, to trans to be able to transform their physical process to the digital process. Yes. But this is something I'm busy. Thank you very much, Yang Anain. Uh, so let's move on with Lydia. Lydia, please. Hi everyone, um, <clears throat> my name is Lydia. Um, I, I run a small company called Think Technique. Uh, on, although we are small, we're actually a digital full suite agency and marketing consultancy. And we serve both large and small clients throughout the Asia Pacific region. So uh, there are three types of areas that uh, we cover, depending on the size of the clients that we work with. We work with some MNCs and we are actually uh, functioning as the extended marketing arm. Uh, they have their own sales and marketing teams in-house, but usually they need more support in terms of digital strategy. And we have that because all of us are digital natives. And so they look to us and we partner with them to come up with uh, a robust uh, digital program in order to uh, hit their business objectives. We are also for SMEs, a trusted advisor, or usually we work with the SME owners themselves. Uh, we work directly with the owners because they need to have a better understanding of what they can do uh, on digital platforms in order to grow their business. And lastly, but uh, not the least, we also work with startups. So we're actually consultants for startups and we help the founding teams to get from so-called zero to hero. Uh, so this is what we do. Uh, and basically we help to strategize uh, digital programs for our clients so that they know um, what they need to do. Usually they know like uh, a little bit here and there, but they're not sure how do they start or if they think they know how to start, they also are not sure how to use uh, the, the digital landscape uh, fully to their benefit. So uh, we help them in terms of insights uh, content and consultancy. Um, so what we've seen uh, moving into the pandemic, actually it's uh, obviously we're all affected by the pandemic. Uh, one thing that maybe is a blessing uh, is that in Singapore, the internet co connectivity is, uh, is great. So we, we have uh, the, the ability for most businesses to move their operations somehow uh, online. Uh, so that's what we've been seeing uh, in this past one year or so, uh, where a lot of businesses have been forced to move their operations online. Um, and actually, uh, we see this as a, a good thing, a plus point, because um, we've been trying to push some, some clients to go digital, but you know, they, they have not been you know, uh, feeling the need to but in this year, they begin to realize that there's no, there's no choice for them. So at the start of the pandemic, they were thinking that maybe this would tide over. Uh, but after they realized that it's not going to go away, then they, so now everyone is uh, shifting all kinds of um, operations, whether it's their systems or whether it is um, uh, meetings with their uh, clients or meeting with their colleagues everything has been shifted online. Um, and what we have seen, I think it was a McKinsey, or I can't remember some, uh, what report it was, but there was uh, in span of five years, what um, CMOs and CEOs, you know, they didn't want to shift online. It has been squashed into a period of a few months and now that progressive uh, digital transformation we've seen in usually takes five years, but now in a few months, it has been achieved. So this is really unprecedented. Yeah, and it's exciting news also for us in the digital sphere, because that means more opportunities to guide our clients on what they can do uh, moving forward. Yeah, so that's what we see in Singapore. Thank you very much, Lydia. Uh, yeah, again, this spectacular acceleration of the digital transformation. Uh, now, let's get the perspective from Eleni at the Asia Foundation. Uh, at the Asia Foundation, you have just started the Go Digital ASEAN initiative to work precisely with ASEAN MSMEs. Can you please describe this initiative to us? Melanie, the floor is yours. 
Well, thank you so much, uh, Yulia, and thank you to Aria for inviting me in today to share a little bit about what we're doing here at the Asia Foundation across the whole of ASEAN. Um, as Yulia mentioned, um, I work here with the Asia Foundation. I'm based in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Uh, the Asia Foundation is an international non-governmental organization that's been working in Asia for more than 65 years, uh, and we have offices across 18 countries. Um, I, we're really excited um, to have launched uh, quite recently uh, in June of 2020, the Go Digital ASEAN program with funding support from Google.org, which is the philanthropic uh, arm of uh, Google. Um, this program focuses on digital skills training uh, to primarily underserved communities across Southeast Asia. Uh, this regional initiative uh, seeks to reach more than 200,000 MSMEs that include women, uh, youth, and really targeting uh, rural and underserved uh, or isolated communities through the program. We do hope that this program will really unlock opportunities in this rapid evolving digital economy across the region that we've just heard from uh, in, from this, the last two speakers. Overall, the goal <clears throat> that we're seeking to achieve will be to equip both MSMEs and underemployed youth uh, with the crucial digital skills that they need to expand their own opportunities economically and minimize the negative impacts of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, here at the Asia Foundation and, and my colleagues across the region think that the real significance of the work that we're doing at the moment is that, as we all know, COVID-19 has really upended businesses uh, everywhere, but particularly here in Southeast Asia, uh, we see that the need, and I think it's just echoes what uh, we've heard from Lydia, the absolute need to master this new digital landscape is now more important than ever. We also find that this unique moment in time, uh, governments are also starting to realize that there is a really important need to rapidly increase the abilities of MSMEs to use these online tools that are available and out there and be able to market their businesses uh, to be more uh, competitive and to grow. Um, which is why we're so excited that the Go Digital ASEAN program has been endorsed through the ASEAN uh, Secretariat through their MSME um, uh, coordinating committee um, across all 10 uh, nations. And finally, um, if I just might add that the digital divide, as we see um, the underconnected across Southeast Asia and the hyper-digitalized, um, is only going to deepen in this current crisis. And I think that if we can provide an opportunity uh, for providing additional digital integration, that we can help to bridge that divide uh, and really create a more inclusive ASEAN region. Thank you very much, Melanie, also for talking about the digital divide. I think we will hear more and more about that uh, uh, in the coming years. Uh, now, let's uh, get a perspective from Rashesh, my colleague from ARIA. So the issue of skills for the future of work is getting absolutely key for ASEAN, as we have just heard from speakers, and certainly also for MSMEs. Cognitive skills are very important, but there is an increased recognition that other types of skills are equally crucial. Can you please explain to us what non-cognitive skills are and why they are so important? Rashesh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Julia, and uh, it's good to be back again to this uh, important seminar. And I think uh, it's it's doing a really good job of of, uh, of uh, highlighting that the key issues that MSMEs face in the region. Uh, uh, and on the issue of skills, I think it's very important, like our previous speakers have uh, mentioned. So let me first start by uh, saying that digitalization, of course, presents a tremendous opportunities for SMEs to grow their businesses by providing them access to a larger market. Um, at the same time, it also brings additional competition from other SMEs and from larger businesses that can generally offer lower prices. So generally, uh, SMEs could find it very hard to compete with larger businesses on the just on the price. So they really have to focus on developing a niche market for the products, by adding value that is uniquely associated with their businesses. Um, the product itself does not have to be unique. Of course, many uh, SMEs uh, sell exact same products online. Uh, so many are retail sellers. Um, a lot of those value added could instead come from efficiently managing the business uh, with working with uh, working well with suppliers and customers, optimizing the visibility in those online platforms. Um, so th this kind of efficiency gains will allow SMEs to charge a reasonable price and, and still make some profit and, and remain competitive. Um, however, gaining such efficiency does take certain types of skills. Um, 
So we can distinguish between three types of skills that are generally considered to be very important to perform the job tasks these days. Uh, we can uh, cognitive skills, technical skills, and social emotional or non-cognitive skills. Uh, cognitive skills is fundamentally the ability to think, reason, and process information. Uh, it is required to perform tasks such as analyzing data, uh, making decisions about uh, changing circumstances, interpreting information, etc. Likewise, technical skills are those that are directly related to completing a job or, job or a task, um, such as ability to uh, operate computers, machineries, um, using specific tools. I mean, these two types of skills are actually well recognized to be very important. More recently, however, there has been an increased emphasis in the importance of social emotional skills or non cognitive skills. Um, so generally speaking, non-cognitive skills, uh, these include behaviors, attitudes, and values that are needed to navigate interpersonal and social situations. Uh, personality traits are the basis for these social and emotional skills. Uh, personality traits are usually defined as patterns of thought, feelings, or behavior that reflect the tendency to respond in certain ways under certain circumstances. Uh, these are related to your psychology. Um, a widely used concept classifies different personality traits into the what's called the big five personality dimensions, agreeableness, extraversion, emotional stability, conscientiousness, and openness to experience. Uh, we hear, we, I'm sure we have heard of things like uh, terms like growth mindset, self-esteem. Uh, these are found to be very important uh, for successes uh, in, the, in the labor market, including those for SMEs. Um, so these kind of non-cognitive skills are usually required to some per per tasks that are required some interpersonal touch. Uh, for example, you think about uh, establishing and maintaining relationships, problem solving in social settings, uh, adapting to changes uh, in the economic landscape, exploring new ideas, uh, guiding, directing, and motivating others, or coaching and developing others. Uh, in the short term, uh, one of these key, one of the key determining factor to success of SMEs is going to be these the the, the skills of the entrepreneurs. Uh, entrepreneurs that have non-cognitive uh, skills would be able to identify new market opportunities. They would be able to provide better customer service. Uh, they'll be able to maintain good relationships with their suppliers and customers, and they'll be able to continuously learn and grow. Um, in the economic context, when I call this personality traits skill, I'm sort of implying a couple of things. Uh, first one is that these are not innate characteristics that you're born with. Rather, these are attributes that can be acquired uh, through training and, and, and learning. Um, of course, entrepreneurs differ in the endowment of these kind of skills. However, a lot of skills that are lacking could be learned. Um, second, the acquiring these skills should make a difference in terms of the economic uh, outcome, uh, in terms of when it, when it comes to higher profits, greater sales, greater productivity, etc. Uh, labor economists are still trying to understand uh, the contribution of these skills to the labor market outcomes. Uh, a lot of research has this is trying to understand when these cognitive skills are formed, whether they persist over the life cycle, or whether they are passed on by parents. Um, what we do know is that digitalization and technology has increased the importance of non-cognitive skills, as many cognitive tasks that are special those that are routine have already been automated and, and can be done by computers. The majority of the non-cognitive skills are still not automatable and are quite indeed quite safe from automation because they cannot be easily programmed into a computer. So that's the general overview, thank you. Thank you very much, Rashesh, for clearly saying why non-cognitive skills are important and are becoming even more important. Uh, now we can immediately start our second round and let's start again with our two entrepreneurs. So I would ask them uh, to please share with us some thoughts about what skills they feel are needed to thrive in the digital economy, especially post-pandemic. And also, uh, please to tell us uh, what uh, they think about the different national initiatives that are currently available, whether they feel that they adequately address the needs of MSMEs, or if maybe something more can be done. And this time, let's start with Lydia in Singapore. Yes, thank you. Um, I think one of the skills, or I would say it's a bundle of skills, uh, um, is digital, uh, understanding the digital landscape. Um, but if I if I put this back one, uh, just take it back a bit. Uh, um, I think it is about what uh, uh, we are talking about right here is growth growth mindset, and in fact, um, this is the key thing that I think we need uh, post pandemic or even right now, um, because you can see that things are really shifting so fast, and we need to understand that. Uh, 
in order to move ahead to the whatever is next after pandemic, we need to approach it from a what's going to happen next and then what can I do to uh, improve myself in order to uh, face the challenges that come. And this requires actually, it's not just about um, a specific skill, it's about the mindset of growing. Uh, yes, so I think growth mindset is really important. Um, at least with, with us at Think Technique, it is one of our value pillars as well. So we are committed to the learning and development of, of people and clients. Um, and uh, what uh, we do, for example, I, I can give you an example, is that internally, we have a weekly learning hour that we schedule during the work week. Um, and during this learning hour, our employees uh, can choose to learn whatever they wish, you know, uh, of course, they have to submit it to their supervisor to get approval that this is kind of uh, going to benefit their job, but they can learn whatever they want in an area of interest that they like. And they're encouraged to take courses uh, in, and uh, they're encouraged to upskill themselves individually. Um, and, you know, this, this can't be possible if um, uh, the employee does not have a growth mindset. Uh, so I think it also starts with... Um, the hiring process as well, like what you look for when uh, as an SME, uh, the kind of people that you look for in your organization. Uh, and I would encourage that uh, to, to hire people who have this kind of hunger to learn, to grow, to, to be better at what they're doing. Um, so if I, I pull it back to in, in our uh, industry in digital, of course, um, one of the key things that we, we need uh, to look at is how can we increase in our digital skills? And this doesn't mean like, how do we use Facebook? How do we, uh, you know, go, go on search? It's more than that. It's moving from, I feel, from a consumer to a producer. So as a consumer, it's very easy. You go to Facebook and you consume. But as a producer, it means like, how are you going to use uh, Facebook to actually um, produce something that would uh, um, help uh, reach out to your perspective uh, target audiences. So it's this shift that needs to take place, especially now, uh, and of course, moving post pandemic. Uh, then in terms of what um, the government is doing in Singapore to encourage um, SMEs to uh, you know, survive or thrive during this time, um, there's been a lot of initiatives that have come up and we are thankful to the government for that. Uh, these initiatives tend to be monetary in nature. There is some grants or funding uh, that is the government provides uh, so that it makes uh, our life a bit, a bit easier uh, to get certain things done, especially during this time where cash flow can be tighter. Um, and we see uh, these initiatives uh, does have a ripple effect. Um, and even they have uh, things like helping SMEs to get access to laptops at a, a reduced price, you know, and these things that we really, really are thankful for, for the government to do such things. Um, but I think it has to move beyond just monetary. Uh, it needs to move into a, a interaction from public and private uh, to see uh, what next especially in the areas of, I think, cybersecurity is key on my mind right now. Yeah, I think my time is up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lydia. Uh, so now let's get the perspective from Yang Nine. Yes, uh, thank you so much for giving me the chance to discuss. So for the questions for the post of COVID-19, so as I like mentioned at the very first, that we have to uh, change and develop our strategy before that we actually set up on before the COVID nineteen. So now, even including me, like for my business, like we what we try to do is as as I am handling three different type of businesses. What we try to do is that we try to cooperate with other people or the other other business together. So the, uh, that's the collaboration skill is very important. To we cannot stand alone this time, isn't it? Even before, yeah. So that we have to collaborate more and more with the other, so vertically and horizontally. So different categories, we have to work together. Even those, even now what we try to do is some, sometimes, you know, people think like the same you know, and, um, business, um, we compete each other. Uh, this time is not true. We have to actually, the same type of business understand our pain inside, you know, 
So that this is we have the, the same. It's two o'clock. Same by uh, you know patching and those kind. That's why like uh, the same type of business we have to work together in order to have a meaningful impact and to uh, to to uh, to to be one of the survival after the COVID nineteen. So number one important thing is the collaborations, uh, vertically and horizontally. Horizontally. The second skill is a lot of digital, which is very important. And so whatever you do. The video shootings and other uh, digital related things, you know, audio editing and, and, and you know, design things, they will be very uh, common skill. You know, whatever you want to do in the 21st century is not for the COVID-19, you know, the, that will be not the special skill that, that we will have. That will be very normal skill, you know, the, this is a video edit, uh, you know, um, Photoshop and, and, and those kind of things, shootings and that kind of things will be very normal skill after that. So this is going to be the second skill we will meet at the very bottom of the line. So um, the third skill is going to be like how to uh, scale up our skill uh, using uh, the leveraging, uh, utilizing the uh, ICT skill. You know, this, this, it, there are so many opportunities at the COVID-19. Even in me, actually, my business are, are still small. Because we are also a startup uh, business. But we got a huge opportunity, for example, in Yangon, Myanmar. Because my business, when I started my business, I didn't start in Yango. Basically, I uh, just, my business my business was not initiated at the uh, you know the big city. It was a very small town. But I moved in 2020. But luckily, you know, pandemic happened. <laughs> so actually, when I trying to scale up my business, so what did what did I do? People don't use uh, business and people they don't want to use their money. Of course, I also don't want to use. It. So what I do, I try to create a more and more event and try to make a very impactful event that I didn't advertise at all. I didn't advertise. So the first, my strategy has a two step. Number one is no money for advertising. This is the first step. So for the, now this is in the second phase of so my strategy that's it. I will scale up so I will use a little bit of money, money, but not much. The, the event there relatively the advantages is people don't want to use their money, but and that's why you know what, what did they do? They, they didn't do any meaningful things and event they just trying to use their money so people they will get to know people they will know them but what we're trying to do is make a meaningful impact like events or other promotion then people will get to know and uh, that will be like uh, and lots of the people are not using money so there's a very good chance that just a few people are using money and that will be very good for brand position uh, this is a kind of preparation for you know the, 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 uh, for the post COVID COVID-19 as well but I'm not sure whether we're going to go post or we will live or with COVID-19, no, no, nobody knows now. So the, the needs of the SMEs and now the Myanmar government for the second part of the question, Myanmar government has, has initiated like uh, COVID-19 economic release plan. There's, they are um, a part of the, the, the economic plan. However, as a nationwide level that the people are still having the problem, you know, their challenges to basically uh, to face and uh, tackle. That's why what I'm trying to do is the people, uh, government, they, uh, they, will time, they will do their job as much as possible, but we have to shift our strategy before some post and during the COVID-19. There are so many opportunities for the marketing and brand position as well as for the sale targets. However, we have to do our best to pass through that. Collaboration, these are uh, very visited to the school like the shooting and also to scale up our, uh, our branding as well. Thank you. So this, this is the conclusion of the uh, my part. Thank, thanks for that. Thank you very much, Yang Nine, for this very interesting perspective. Uh, now let's uh, uh, get the perspective from Rashesh. So we talked earlier about non-cognitive skills. What can you tell us about what uh, governments can do to promote the development of these skills across not only students, but also the workforce, such as people working in MSMEs? Rashesh, please. Yeah, uh, thanks, Julia. It's a very important question um, about how do we, can we acquire these skills um, that are considered to be very important for success for in, in labor market, uh, also for SMEs. So um, one big advantage that SMEs, or one big disadvantage that SMEs have compared to larger firms is that they don't have many employees who can bring different skill sets. So generally, if a firm value certain skills, they can hire employees that bring those particular skill set, right? And and workers from different skill, different skill set, they will specialize in tasks that are the most suited for, thus increasing the overall efficiency of the firm. For SMEs, usually they have very limited opportunities to do so because they're usually very small. They are sole proprietorships or only have, have a few employees. 
So the entrepreneur himself or herself has to be very uh, good at uh, doing a lot of different things, uh, including tasks that require non-cognitive skills. In addition, a lot of non-cognitive skills actually are developed in social settings, right? So in larger firms, a lot of innovation and efficiency gains happen because of interactions between different employees um, who bring different skills and perspectives. However, for SMEs, this is usually there's very limited opportunities to learn new ideas uh, because they're most of them are working on their own um, or, or only with a few employees. Um, so to address these issues, I think a couple of things that governments can do. Um, one is they could try to invest uh, more in, in ways for entrepreneurs to develop these non cognitive skills. Some of this could happen through, for example, networking opportunities, seminars, training programs, et cetera. So this is one good example of, of how the skills could be acquired uh, through through some, some sharing of information. Uh, but these are generally, these kind of events are costly and, and the benefits are not 100% certain because you don't know exactly what, how those uh, skills might be developed. So whenever there's a cost associated, um, then SMEs are not very keen to invest on their own. So this is where the governments could step in. Um, so I think public radio and television are a great way to disseminate useful information that could help entrepreneurs, um, including development of these non-cognitive skills. So governments could fund uh, cre creation dissemination of these kind of programs uh, for public consumption. Uh, these days with digital communication technology, it's fairly easy to reach a, la reach a large uh, population uh, through podcasts and online lessons, uh, which actually Melanie mentioned uh, briefly in her previous uh, remark. Um, governments could also create formal or informal platforms where entrepreneurs could interact face-to-face -to, -face, uh, to develop their skills, social skills and, and foster some kind of community learning. Um, so I think overall governments should provide some sort of digital extension services that will support SMEs transition to the online marketplace. Uh, the services service could be provided privately through uh, with government support or, or entirely run by the government themselves, uh, similar to the agriculture extension services that were very popular for agriculture improvement. Uh, support for consulting services like those uh, run by Lydia and Nian and Yang could also be a good good way of uh, a very viable way of helping SMEs develop these non-cognitive skills. Um, SMEs could also benefit from having a broad pool of talented workers who have positive skills. This means that the public education system would have to be reformed to provide high quality cognitive, social, emotional, as well as technical skills for a holistic development of the of the workers. Uh, and this will enable the SMEs to navigate the digital marketplace better by by having access to workers who have who have these uh, new digital skills. One challenge, I think, in incorporating non cognitive skills uh, into the skill development system is that they're very hard to measure. So it is not clear what kind of pedagogical approaches is, will be successful in developing these non cognitive skills. It's also hard to develop group training programs and to provide certification that will uh, certify that the individual possesses these kind of skills. Uh, developing new performance evaluation mechanisms that paint a holistic picture of the skills would, would be required. Um, researchers are still trying to figure out the best way to incorporate non-cognitive skills into the education and training system. Um, so when it comes to development of the skills, researchers have found that the foundations of skills are formed at home through parental input. So parental investment is found to be quite important in formation of both cognitive and non-cognitive skills. Furthermore, skills beget more skills and there are cross effects from one type of skills to another because skills accumulate over time. So if you have a weak foundation uh, from the beginning of, uh, of your life, then, it's, it, then it can accumulate uh, knowledge learning gaps. Uh, so investments in experiences and uh, environmental inputs uh, that foster learning at a very early stage of life uh, would increase the, the investment in later stages and also have a better suited to develop these non-cognitive skills. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashesh, also for bringing in uh, the, the issue of uh, not only measurement, but also assessment of, you know, this, this different type of uh, skill sets. Um, before um, moving to Melanie for the conclusive um, question of the second round, let me remind you that we are soon starting the Q&A session. So please feel free to uh, <clears throat> insert and use the chat box for questions uh, for speakers. Now, to Melanie again. Uh, what do you think are the skills that will be necessary for MSMEs to go digital in the post-pandemic phase? We have already heard about uh, these uh, from the different speakers, but we are very happy to get now the perspective from the Asia Foundation. Uh, please, Melanie. Uh, thank you, Yulia. Um, indeed, I think, well, first of all, I think that there are some uh, skills that um, in the pre-COVID phase and the post-pandemic phase will remain uh, very similar and very much the same. 
Um, it's just a, a little bit, as previous speakers have mentioned, that things have been, uh, I think the word was squashed. Um, things have, have happened a lot more quickly um, in, the, in the past few months here than expected. Um, you know, one of the things that we did at the start of our program was to really do a comprehensive needs assessment, to go around and ask our beneficiaries, uh, those people working across uh, Southeast Asia, again, uh, reminding the audience here that we are working with very underserved communities, remote places. Uh, we're not working uh, predominantly in urban settings where there's already a significant uh, connectivity and significant uh, skills uh, opportunities. So for our digital uh, literacy program and digital engagement, we really tried to look at uh, MSMEs who are, are really outside um, the, the, the day to day. Um, we, we, here in Cambodia, for example, uh, when we went out and spoke with people, more than 50% of, of those people who we spoke with were saying that they had trouble just downloading an app or setting up an email account. These were new things. So while, whereas we can look at things in Singapore as being very different, uh, here right on the ground in, in Cambodia, we're finding that these sort of, sort of basic skills, uh, digital skills are, are, are keep, keeping people, be, uh, leaving people behind. Um, we also had discussions, for example, uh, with folks in, in various rural parts of Myanmar. Um, and uh, Van Nyang is on, on the call with us. Um, but again, we were, we were asked questions about, can you, can you explain further? What, what do you really mean? What is digital literacy? What is it? And how does it work? And, and so a lot of information about um, just the concept of digital literacy in the first place. And so I think while we see a, a, a variety and, and it's, it's very uneven across Southeast Asia, but we see that oftentimes um, you know, that ubiquitous smart, smartphone is being used primarily for entertainment and communications and not really for businesses. And how to separate you know, the, the business from the, the family is, is very challenging. Um, we have, have a great little story here from a, a fish cake seller in Batambo in Cambodia who noticed uh, the uh, fish cake seller across the road was doing a far better business than she was. And uh, Miss TV said, what is going on? This is, uh, why is she getting so much more business? And she realized that her neighbor had uh, put herself on Facebook and had put up a page selling her the best fish cakes in Batambang. And as a result, she was getting far more business. So immediately as we were talking with her, she said, listen, I need to learn how to do this. I need to get onto Facebook too and market my fish cake business because my fish cakes are much better. <laughs> so again, you know, you have these kinds of uh, very personal reasons why people want to become um, digitally connected. Um, the kinds of topics that we're covering, again, uh, they range across the region. And so one of the things that we've really focused on throughout this uh, program development phase for Go to Digital ASEAN has been tailor making the needs and the context in each and every country where we're working uh, across ASEAN. So I think, of course, everywhere we're looking at online safety. Everyone needs to be able to get online safely uh, and do it effectively and understand uh, those, those basic concepts. Um, we also have, a, as I just mentioned, the case of, of Phoebe. She wants to get um, clearly social media marketing. How do you, how, how does she market her business on social media? Um, we've had others who people can't, because of, of mapping and they're rural, people can't find them. They want to be registered on Google Maps so that somebody can find my little restaurant uh, to come and eat noodles. Uh, but they can't find me unless I'm on Google Maps. Um, E-commerce platforms, selling products online. Um, financial applications uh, in one country, um, let's see here, where is it? Currency converters um, was a comment made from people in, in Myanmar. Um, how, how, do we, how do we use those and uh, that sort of thing? And how do we learn about government support for MSMEs? Another uh, comment from Myanmar. Taking professional photos, I think that was mentioned by Van Ming too. Very important to learn how to market and present things. Creating business plans, online searches, uh, and many other topics. Uh, across the region that we heard. So thank you, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Marilyn, that was really fascinating. Thank you very much for reminding us about the urban-rural divide. It's a very important topic and sometimes because uh, we are living online, we tend to forget that, but uh, it's, it's, it's an issue that uh, uh, people will have to think creatively on how to address. And also for the fascinating stories of the different entrepreneurs from the fish cake entrepreneurs, uh, to the ones that wanted to use currency exchanges and many more. Uh, thank you again. Now I will give the floor to TJ immediately for the Q&A session. 
Thank you, Julia. Um, thank you very much for the speakers. Um, again, you know, if you have any questions, please feel free to key it into the chat box. So let me just uh, start with the first question that we have. Um, and the question is, how should we deliver the job trainings practically through digital? You know, so, um, I mean, we've been talking about, we need to do this. Uh, so maybe if I can just throw this question to our entrepreneurs first, you know, when it comes to the current landscape, uh, and we talk about job training, you know, equipping, um, to you, what is considered an effective way of doing this? Uh, perhaps I could, I could have uh, Yen Niang share a little bit with us, you know, for the next one, two minutes, and then we will move on to Lydia. Thank you so much for the questions. Because like uh, the training business is one of my uh, the business that I've been managing. So the Draw Institute provide the customized trainings and also the executive learning pro programs as well. So then we've been actually working on the uh, VR AR training as well. But now we've been really uh, using Zoom or other you know the uh, team or mates or things like that. So there are a couple of, a couple of things that um, uh, that you can do. For example, but the most important thing is uh, very, uh, you need to know the, what kind of skill set the employees are actually needing. For example, uh, sometimes like we have, we have a client, like we have, a, we, we have a client for a wide range of the NGOs and, you know, a UN organization or corporates as well, and also the media side business as well. So then uh, sometimes the HR uh, department, they already like uh, do assessment, right? They already did assessment, then, then we just need to collaborate with them and then provide the training, design the training. So the most important thing is how, uh, there's a two part, uh, uh, two part. Number one is you need to know which the, uh, our like uh, team members need. This is uh, to under define the skill set they need. The second is the, uh, the, the what kind of challenges you are facing. So uh, normally people provide training for talent development as well as to um, overcome the challenges they are facing. Sometimes, you know, people are, uh, they just don't like each other, you know, the different departments, you know, they just uh, got angry, you know, when they try to collaborate for different projects. So this is things that they need the training. So that I believe that for, uh, to, in order to for deliver the, the different type of trainings and talent, talent and or skill set, the, the, the organization need to know what, uh, or need to do assessments or things like that. Or like, for example, we, we also provide the kind of service for that for some organization when they don't have it. But what I'm trying to say is the, what kind of skill sets they need. And we need to find a way that, uh, the second is the, uh, we can use, utilize a uh, digital skill for example, even now we've been preparing for uh, VR learning um, uh, uh, style. For example, you're utilizing the uh, VR technologies and that there are uh, for different different uh, services. So this is all now for the very cheap process is like Zoom or like very, very cheap. And also that in terms of uh, for the uh, utilizing that uh, technology, but two things, this is something I want to say. That this, um, you need to know before you provide the trainings or the other talent development or training. You need to okay. know what we need. Yeah. Thank you so much. So needs, challenges. How about Lydia? Let's hear from you. Uh, okay, thank you so much for that question. In fact, uh, this is something that we do with our clients. We help them with their in-house teams to upskill their personnel. So usually when you, you, you don't want to have something like engage a digital consultant for long term and then you keep paying them, right? That, that's in our heart too. So uh, we, are quite un, uh, we are quite unorthodox. So we, we don't want our clients to stay with us for too long a time doing the same thing. So we try to upskill their key personnel in-house. So we have worked with uh, some organizations where we sit with the person, this is pre-COVID, but we can modify it during COVID or post-COVID. And I encourage you to also uh, speak with a digital consultant, you know, similar in similar field like us, like um, ask them what, what actually are the skill sets that they think that your team is lacking because they can give an outsider point of view, a clearer point of view rather than yourself. After that, when they've assessed, oh, this is what it is, right? Then uh, select one of your key uh, personnel to be trained, one or two. 
And uh, this uh, consultant would sit together with this person side by side uh, uh, to train that person in this thing. So first of all, the consultant will be the one doing it. Then this key personnel of yours would watch. And then after that, the key personnel will learn how to do it himself. And then the consultant would watch, right? And after that, uh, give some uh, of their advice on, hey, you're doing this wrong, or you should correct this, kind of like step by step. So when you guide the person step by step like that on on-job training, it is going to be much more fruitful. And I also understand because a lot of the courses that, um, that are put out there, right, are not practical in nature. It's like, okay, after I've learned this, then now what? So I, I always feel that it's better to, in your uh, company landscape itself, like, okay, this is what that key personnel needs to do on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, but he doesn't know, know how to do it. So let's fix it at, the, at that very instant. So this training, so-called hand-in-hand training, is no longer like something like theory, it's practical, like right, whatever you need right now, at the same time, you, you are upskilling your personnel and at the same time, you are solving the key problem. So we did this before for to upskill uh, in one of the companies, for example, uh, to upskill on social media marketing and how to use Google My Business. So these are the things that you can do. Um, yeah, um, yeah, my time is up. If you have if you have a, a key point, you know that 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 you want to just quickly deliver, um, I will gladly give you another thirty seconds to to do that because I think you were about to hit on something, yeah. So so do carry on, do carry on. Okay, uh, I just wanted to say that you know um, don't don't make it feel theoretical. You need to make it practical and speak to the right consultants. If you speak with a consultant agency which understands this point right, they will help you to fix the practical with a practical solution at your day-to-day -day level, the job day-to-day -day level. Get them to look through your exact like uh, websites, you know, social media, whatever it is, and not some other persons. So when you do that, then that becomes very, very practical. You can see results within like a few months, mm. guaranteed, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Lydia. Um, I like what she said because it is, it is really about practicality. It is about um, also zooming in being very focused uh, so that it is for your dollar spent, like what Yen Yang was saying, maximum impact, minimum cost. And then you get that influence that you need. Um, also a little bit on train the trainers. Um, perhaps on, on that, if I may link it to, you know, I, I find what Russia sh shared to be very interesting on the non-cognitive part, uh, non-cognitive skills. Um, if I, may, if I may throw then this question to Russia as well as Melanie, in your interaction um, between the rural and urban landscapes, especially in greater ASEAN, Singapore is too small. My rural and my, and my urban is it's kind of like, you know, just one door apart. But, you know, the minute we get out of Singapore to, to the other parts of um, ASEAN, um, what, what, is there a difference in this non-cognitive um, skills that you see um, amongst the MSMEs, um, you know, in, in your areas? Uh, perhaps if I could have Russia share based on your interaction, you know, between rural and urban, is there a difference in the non-cognitive skill sets that, that, are, that perhaps the entrepreneurs, um, they, they, they feel that they lack or they need? uh thanks for the question uh it's a tough question for me because i <laughs> i mostly deal with uh data so uh and, and like data, i mentioned yeah yeah so like i mentioned before right i mean it's very hard to find good data on non-cognitive skills so far because it is uh, based on personality traits so there are some psychologists have come up with different ways to measure these kind of non-cognitive skills um and but unfortunately it's not very widespread so it's very hard to say anything concrete about you know is there a difference between urban and rural areas the other issue is that um because we don't have a good uh systems to develop the skills so a lot of the things that we measure are going to be something that's innate to the individual 
And in that respect, actually, it's, there's no, I don't think there's any differences between urban and rural because it really depends a lot on the personality of appearance, for example. It depends on how you've grown up, how you interacted with your friends in your, in your school, uh, school life, how, how, what kind of uh, environment you grew up in. So, so there's a lot of this environmental uh, or what's called uh, uh, nurture factors uh, that also go into the, the development of uh, social, uh, this, this uh, non cognitive skills. So, so in that sense, uh, I do not expect there to be much difference in terms of the innate. But what, what does happen is that in the urban areas, you are more able to interact with other people uh, that may be different from you, right? And so, so you're, you're just the, the, the kind of your, your uh, network, so to speak, uh, is larger. And, and, and that's, there's a process of learning from others that tends to be uh, faster or, or more uh, or, uh, varied in the urban landscape. Uh, and, and, th and for that reason, I think uh, there is chance that as people interact more with other people, as as the the the, the, the size of the networks increase, there is a greater chance for uh, uh, for individuals in urban areas to get, to gain these non cognitive skills faster than than those in rural areas. And and this just comes from just from social interactions, from experience, from from being in a in a varied setting that that comes with. Um, urban um, locations and, and there's this term in economics called agglomeration economies right so the fact that a lot of people are together in the same location uh, helps uh, increase the skills of everyone and that that's something that's found in silicon valley for example in terms of cognitive mm -hmm. skills in terms of technical skills because people in coders interact with each other and look, do learn new things way to learn new ways to do things. And same thing happens in non-cognitive skills as well. So you interact with other people with different walks of life, you learn about their processes, and then that sort of increases your own skills in this aspect. So in that sense, I think the fact that interaction happens faster in urban, uh, more in urban areas tends to uh, uh, me to, I guess, conjecture that, you know, urban areas might have uh, some, some uh, uh, better uh, or higher levels of non-cognitive skills as well. Thank you very much, Rajesh. I think that was a very good answer, uh, considering that it was just data that you were looking at. Um, Melanie, in, I guess in the same way, with the Go Digital program that has been rolled out by the Asia Foundation, um, on, on this, do you see, do you see uh, some differences between you know, um, your rural interactions and the urban interactions, especially with the business owners? Um, you know, we'll be happy to hear your thoughts on this. Sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks, TJ. And um, Rajesh, I just want to mention that uh, in my early career, um, I started in Nepal. <laughs> so uh, local knowledge, local wisdom, uh, really, really critical as you as you start to think through um, developing a program, program like this. And I think one of the things that the foundation is, is fairly well known for is our strong focus on working with uh, locally based partners. And it's these locally based partners who really have that granular level of understanding of how things really work on the ground and how do you build on that local knowledge. Um, and uh, there was another question in the chat box around how do you engage a carpenter or how do you engage a, a craftsperson or how do you engage a, uh, someone working on a home-based business? I mean, this is exactly the type of, of group that we are trying to reach. Um, and one of the things that we found in our training and trainer model was to actually try by identifying how do we get these young, smart, um, college educated uh, folks who are really excited about technology, who want to team up with those community mobilizers, people who know, you know, grandma next door, you know, everything that's going on in the village. And how do you team these people up to be able then to deliver effectively, really sort of straightforward, uh, going back to Lydia's point more again and again, practical, practical, practical information at the level that is going to be effective and helpful um, for, for some of these home-based businesses, for some of these, these you know, groups who might be uh, contributing to the tourism sector. Um, up on the, the link at the moment are a number of, of publications that have just come out about the really detrimental effects on the tourism sector across ASEAN uh, that we've been looking very closely at and, and how have MSMEs fared. And so this is part of regional research that is coming out. Myanmar is out, Thailand's out, Cambodia coming soon. Um, but these are pieces that really take a, a hard look at, at really what's been happening uh, here on the ground. So I would say really going back to that um, 
the importance of working with these local partners who really know what's going on. You know, back to the urban-rural divide, um, uh, again, uh, earlier in the conversation, there was a lot of uh, discussion around growth mindset of, of businesses. Well, I think here at the Asia Foundation and with our partners, we constantly have to say to ourselves, we have a learning mindset. Um, we, we, not, we don't necessarily have all the answers, but we need to, to try different avenues and figure out what works and then, you know, be honest with ourselves when it doesn't work and say, oh, that's not working. Let's, let's try something else here. So I think just being um, very practical and um, looking at this through um, the vast um, knowledgeable resources that we have on the ground throughout Asia um, and, and listening to them and, and what, what seems to be working um, is really the best way that we can sort of proceed on this uh, agenda. Thanks. Thank you very much, Melanie. Really, it's about, I think, keeping our eyes and ears open um, to listen, like what Melanie shared. And, you know, I liked what Yan Yang shared earlier as well, um, that it is, it is now an era of not just vertical collaboration and cooperation, but also horizontal, you know, that stop talking about competition, but really let's talk collaboration, you know. Um, and I would want to throw this out for especially the business people to think about, because as an entrepreneur myself, um, it's getting me excited in that beyond just your local interactions and collaborations, begin to think regional, begin to think how can these conversations go um, from Myanmar to Singapore to Cambodia, you know, to other parts, because there are similar businesses, there are similar interactions, um, you talk about non-cognitive skill, uh, for example, how can Yan Yang from Myanmar be able to share something with Lydia from Singapore um, and then be able to impart this to someone from Cambodia? You know, I think this is the era where with digital, whether you are a new business, a startup, you are a you know, um, SME that has been around for a couple of years, um, now is the time to really begin to break down the borders and say, hey, we are just one digital window away from collaboration, from learning, you know, from growing together. So I want to thank um, everyone for posing your questions. Um, you know, and I want to thank the speakers for really, whenever there's a Q&A, it's never scripted. So I want to thank you for really just flowing with me, flowing with us in the whole conversation. Um, I will hand the floor back to Julia to just close this session then. Over to you, Julia. I don't have much to add. I think TJ already gave the perfect conclusion. So let me just thank everybody again. A special thanks goes to our excellent speakers of today and to all the participants for connecting with us. And please uh, stay tuned as uh, in two weeks time, we'll have the next episode of the series and we will discuss about the agility, or perhaps not, perhaps yes, of micro businesses across ASEAN. So thank you very much, and we hope to see you soon again uh, in this webinar series. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank Rashesh, you. Yangnin, Lydia, and Melanie. Yeah. Thank you again.